welcome to the uh, of, of, of the school. And today we can be the <coughs> so in, in the first half of the day we will have a lecture by Marcus Koch from the University of Oxford. Uh, Marcus uh, has been involved in various activities related to how
However, in contrast to things like URL, OWL also has this logical side, which allows you to draw conclusions from what you specify. And this is, in a way, the asset of OWL, the thing that you want to exploit for your applications, the thing that uh, gives you an advantage over other approaches. However, in order to take advantage of this, reasoning is necessary. And you have seen in the previous days that reasoning is not always an easy task. It can be technically complicated, it can lead to unexpected results, uh, and certainly implementing a reasoner is, is a difficult task in general. So uh, this also makes, makes it hard in some aspects to work with the language. Okay, anyway, as a standard, OWL in principle is compatible with a lot of other important technology standards, starting from Unicode, IRI, XML schema, we've heard about the FLDS schema. Um, important for you as a user at this point is that this is really a big difference to many other approaches to knowledge representation. If you look at things like even Prolo, which is also a standard in a way, and you try to formulate knowledge there, you will have a lot of uh, encoding problems because Unicode is not supported. So uh, you can just write certain labels or identifiers and it can be a, a big mess to just get this compatibility. So in fact, also this is boring for, for a logician, it's quite a useful thing for, for a practitioner, I think. There's this compatibility, I like So there's a lot of technology to build. Um, yesterday, you have seen the data model of L. You already knew the data model of description logic, which is very similar. Uh, so basically, there are three different types of entities in L. And here, I will again call them classes, properties, and individuals. And well, individuals come in two kinds uh, individuals and data materials. So if you talk about numbers, I'll talk about abstract things like uh, the people on the slide yesterday. Then, uh, they are logically rather similar, that's why we treat them as one type of Okay. Now, um, these entities are combined to form expressions, to express relationships between them, and then finally you can uh, combine this relation as these expressions into the things. And that's how we talk about also, you have already learned that there are um, many other technical aspects, uh, lots of syntaxes and semantics. So we have uh, five official syntactic formats, uh, functional style syntax, Manchester syntax, you've seen there's also an Alex and Alex syntax, I'm not sure how uh, everything is used these days. And then there are various syntactic forms based on RDF because you can translate the whole of our into RDF and then you can use any syntactic format that works for RDF to encode. So there's a lot of options. And also on the semantic side, there are two options. There's the direct semantics and the RDF-based semantics. Again, you have seen about this, a bit about this yesterday. OK. Now in this talk, I want to leave most of these technical uh, burdens behind. Uh, as I said, they are not just burdens. They are quite useful. But, uh, I don't want to focus too much on the technical aspects, but rather I want to go down logic lane, uh, metaphorically speaking, so focus on aspects of reasoning, aspects of uh, expressivity, and what you can actually model in the language, and to some extent also which tools you have for this practice. Now, you have already seen that reasoning is quite important in all. Uh, however, reasoning is not just one task, but in fact it is many different tasks as well. So, in general, because we have a logic semantics, we can, uh, every ontology has a lot of logical conclusions we can draw from it. But in fact, there are infinitely many conclusions, right? So it's, even an empty ontology has infinitely many conclusions. So in practice, we are not interested in deriving all conclusions. Nobody ever is. We are always interested in deriving certain conclusions of a certain form, which can be useful in our uh, application. And the typical tasks that we uh, look at normally are instance checking, the task of finding out whether a certain individual is entailed to belong to a certain class. Class subsumption, which is whether one class is inferred to be a subclass of the other, so whether all individuals that are in the one class must necessarily be in the other class as well. Ontology consistency, which means is my ontology free of contradictions? And also class consistency coherence, uh, it's sometimes called. Meaning, given a certain class, is it the case that this class can actually have any individuals? 
is it possible that it can be non empty? Because if you specify, if you model a class with a complex expression, it, it can easily happen that somehow the way is the description that you have given of the class contradicts itself in a way and uh, does not allow anything to satisfy this description. So in fact, the class will always be empty, which is never what you want to do because you already have an empty class in our, our bottom, uh, our nothing, and uh, our bottom in description logic. And so there's really no need to model any other uh, class which is empty. So looking at these four typical problems, we can say the latter two here are mostly what you want to know at design time. When I give you an ontology, you normally expect that it's consistent and it doesn't have inconsistent classes either. So that's something when you develop an ontology, you want to make sure it's consistent, so you have to have a reason that checks that for you. Um, the other two tasks, they can be relevant both at design time and at runtime, depending on how you use your ontology. Uh, because already at design time, it might be correct or incorrect that certain class assumptions hold, and you want to check that. But also at runtime, you can have a tool which directly feeds on these uh, inferences. Now it is known in description logic that all of these tasks can be reduced to each other. Basically, if I have a tool for any of them, I can get a tool for the rest of them by just doing simple modifications. I change the input a bit, and suddenly the tool which was able to answer this question can also answer this question. Um, details about that are in the lecture notes if you are interested. Um, now, however, in practice, it turns out that often we want to use algorithms which are specific for one of the tasks and which do really this one thing very fast and very well without us doing any reduction because even something that is logically easy is often not so easy uh, if you need to do it in a, in a large scale in practice. In general, a very big question and a very important question about reasoning how is uh, the question of computational complexity, the question of hardness. How difficult is it to draw conclusions? And in general, when I say how difficult is it, I should first say what exactly do I expect from such a tool? And what I expect in a reasoner in how is many two properties called soundness and completeness. Soundness means only correct conclusions are computed, so every output of the tool is really a conclusion. And completeness means no correct conclusion is missed, so everything which is a correct conclusion will actually be an output of the tool after a certain time. Completeness in particular, of course, requires that I focus on some of these tasks, because as I said, there are infinitely many conclusions, so uh, of course I could still have an algorithm that produces all of them after some time, but it will never be done. So um, it will, should, I should say, it produces each of them after some time, but it will never have produced all of them, uh, because there are always some more to go. So usually we focus on tasks where there are only finitely many things to be uh, computed, and we hope that our tool is complete. Now in practice, often you are happy with a tool if it's sound, but maybe not necessarily complete. So that depends on your application. If you are designing an ontology, you want it that you, you want your tool to be complete. Because if you write up an ontology in, in Protégé, uh, you really want to be sure that it's, that it's consistent, for example. You, you want to be sure that there's no contradiction, so you need a complete tool that checks all contradictions and, and may, verifies that there are On the other hand, if you use ontologies in an uh, application where you do reasoning at runtime, for example, in a search, say an enterprise search, you have a document search and you use an ontology backend to improve the results. Then in this case, you might be happy to get some meaningful results which help you to find more documents in your enterprise search. Even if you miss some, that might not be such a tragedy in the end. Uh, so completeness sometimes can be neglected and it can be useful to have incomplete systems. Now unfortunately, as you already have learned uh, yesterday, reasoning can be very hard. Uh, Yesterday it was mentioned that for the RDF-based semantics it's even undecided. So there's no algorithm that can, for every possible ontology as an input, uh, compute reliably whether this ontology is consistent or not in some finite time. So
So either in some cases it will run forever, or in some cases it will not find the right result. There are some, something has to be uh, has to be given up. Undesirability, not nice. We try to avoid that. On the other hand, even LDL, uh, also it is desirable in this respect, has a very high complexity, namely a complexity of n 2x time. I'm not sure if anybody has mentioned that yet. Uh, who in the room knows what NP hardness or NP hardness means? Uh, okay, knows. Very good. Okay, so who has heard of the of complexity like NP? Uh, okay, so, yeah, so, yeah, so, left. so what does it mean for a problem to be in, P, in pol polynomial time? It means that a computer, we often speak of Turing machines because there are little model computers, but they're really not so much different from, from my MacBook Pro here. Uh, but my MacBook has only finite memory, which is maybe a different from a Turing machine. But uh, we use these model computers, these Turing machines, and if a problem can be solved in polynomial time, it means that a Turing machine, which is like a little automaton running on a tape, um, will need only a polynomial number of steps on arbitrary inputs. What do I mean by this? I, that means that there is a polynomial function uh, which takes as an input the size of my input problem, for example, the size of my ontology in bytes, uh, written down in something else. And as the output, it will give, you, give me an upper bound for how long this uh, machine, my algorithm will run until it actually uh, gives me a result. And if this is only polynomial, I basically have some hope that the problem is scalable in practice. So if I make the problem, the input, twice as large, I will get a polynomial increase, but polynomial might still be manageable in practice. At least, that's, that's the hypothesis. Of course, in practice, you know, if you have ever worked in databases, even a quadratic runtime behavior is unacceptable, right? So if, if you have an input of the size 1 million and you have an upper bound on one mil of 1 million squared steps, that is already very bad. So in practice, we often need something even better. But still, it gives us a good idea. If something is polynomial, it's going to be implementable with less effort. Now, what does it mean to be an NP? An NP it means same thing, polynomial time, but there's an n. And the n means not non-polynomial, as, as sometimes people you believe, but rather it means that the computer that I use is allowed to make guesses. So it's non-deterministic. Uh, which means that uh, if I, basically I guess the solution and I can check in polynomial time if it's the right solution. You all know that if you play uh, Sudoku, Sudoku, is it? Like that, you know the thing with the squares and little numbers. Uh, so, uh, if somebody tells you the solution to a Sudoku square, it's very easy for you to check that it's really a solution. You just check that all the constraints are satisfied. But finding the solution in the first place is very difficult. So, that's a typical NP complete problem. Uh, of course, most Sudokus are quite simple, but uh, you could make them very well. Okay, so that's the N. Now, what does N to X time now mean? It basically it's the same as NP with the only difference that instead of P we have 2x time here, which means we have a double exponential bound. So we guess a solution and if we happen to be right, we can check in double exponential time that it's actually true what we guessed. This really is very, very bad if you think about it. I mean double exponential time is not two times exponential, it's exponential to the power of exponential. So 2 to the power of 2 to the power of 3 is the same as uh, 2 to the power of 8. So you, just, you start with the uh, numbers. And so this uh, gets very big very quickly. So from this perspective, it seems that our reasoning is hopeless. I mean, whether it's undecided or not, this is such a high complexity that in practice you wouldn't really expect it to work. Now, luckily, we have very optimized systems, and luckily, First case, only a person very construed scenarios. So, in many practical applications, you do not have this problem. But still, it shows that uh, things can be very fragile because, in order to survive such a high complexity, you have to have a very um, a highly optimized.
optimized system which, which uses a lot of heuristics, a lot of good guessing, a lot of uh, optimizations. And the, the more complicated your optimizations are and the more advanced your heuristics are, the more likely it is that they fail unexpectedly. So they, they, might have, uh, they might be very effective on some ontology and then you change it to a little bit of it and suddenly nothing works anymore. If you have worked with Protégé and the big ontology, uh, you know that behavior. So you have a nice ontology and you change it a little bit and suddenly your reasoner goes out for lunch and never comes back to you in time. So that is, that is in general a problem because these systems are so sophisticated and advanced. So there is certainly a merit in looking at simpler languages and this is what my talk is about. Okay, let me recall one more thing here. Uh, this is a, a summary basically of what Pavel has also shown you yesterday, but for only some of the features he has used. So this is a little table of how our functional style syntax relates to description logic syntax. So we have these different types of axioms, subclasses, class assertions, and object property assertions. I don't care about sub properties here. So I only care about subclasses, you know what that is. Class assertions means the individual A is in C. Uh, property assertion means that there is a property P connecting A and B. That's individual. And we can see why it's much nicer to write the R syntax. It's just a lot shorter. And then these are the expressions. These are all the expressions that I would really need in this talk. Uh, we had intersection, which is like conjunction. You say some talk about things which are in class C and in class D. That's why it's similar to the intersection side in set, uh, in set theory, so it's easy to remember. Union is the other thing, uh, it's, it's a dual thing where you have uh, things which are either in C or in D. Complement, the negation of a class. Thing and nothing, the universal class, the empty class, top and bottom. And then, what makes things most interesting in many cases, the uh, property restrictions. Here I can say, these are the things which have some key that is a C, and these are the things with, where all keys are Cs. Like if P would, for example, be children, and C would be professors, that would be the class of things where all children are professors. As uh, some children is a professor, and here all children are professors. And then I also will have a look at this inverse property. So, inverse of the property means you just turn it around. And uh, this we write with p to the power of minus, which is a bit of a bit, it's out here on the slide, but uh, I guess uh, I can tell you a little bit. Okay, so this is, the, uh, this is the syntax we will use. This is just for reminding you how this all will you know. Okay, let me show you some uh, simple. Uh, simple axioms. Well, you have seen so many axioms, maybe we don't have to, 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 to make that too long. So I can say uh, Sylvester is a cat. Sylvester preys on Tweety, so Sylvester hunts, hunts Tweety. Uh, cats are mammals. So that's the Latin, Latin name of mammals that make it look a bit more scientific, my talk. So uh, this is uh, cats are mammals. And this we can translate as the class of things which prey on something, top is just anything, which prey on anything are predators. So a predator is some, uh, whatever preys on, on something else is a predator. And this, on the other hand, says if everything is in the class of the... That's a bit of a, maybe a funny thing to read. Uh, so this says everything is a subclass of the class of things with, where all things that they prey on are animals. What does that mean? It means whenever something preys on anything else, it must this, uh, this thing must be an animal. So everything that is preyed on is an animal. Okay. So then we have a little conjunction here. An animals that play chess are humans, and then we have another uh, axiom here which says mammal, for every mammal we have, if, if something is a mammal, then all its fathers are mammal. So this class is the class of things which have a mammal father. No, not all its fathers, but no, has some mammal father. So every mammal has a mammal uh, as a father. So, uh, okay. And this is the kind of axioms we will, uh, we will meet throughout this talk. 
And it, usually it takes some getting used to. These two types here you know as domain and range axioms in RDFS, for example. So this is the uh, domain of the uh, praise on the property is predator, and this says that the range of praise on this animal. That's, that's okay. Good, now we have uh, semantics. For all, you also have seen that. So basically, it is very simple. You just think of classes as sets, properties as binary relations, and individuals as elements in these sets or in these relations. <laughs> and um, basically, you can obtain all this by translating out of first order logic. We don't care about this. But here again, the correspondence is very simple. In fact, Intersection of two classes is the same as the intersection of the sets which I have for the two classes. Union of the two classes is the same as the union of the two sets. Complement, now we have to think what happens with the complement. Well, we need to have a, a domain set, uh, an overall set of all things we talk about and we just subtract the uh, set which C is assigned to. Top, bottom, and our little uh, <laughs> Basically, you've seen all this, so I'm not going to spend too much time. There's also an RDF based semantics. Uh, you have heard about that yesterday. Uh, very quick wrap up. It is based on translating our ontologies to RDF graphs uh, and then interpreting the RDF graphs instead of the ontologies. This makes things a bit complicated because the RDF graphs just consist of edges and nodes and the our ontology actually had a lot more complex data structures that had expressions and axioms, and suddenly all of this just looks like uh, nodes and, and edges, and we somehow have to define uh, meaning now on this level of nodes and edges. And uh, it has been done in a way which makes direct semantics and RDF based semantics agree under many reasonable conditions. So I think for practitioners, for anybody using it, it just doesn't matter at all. Um, it shouldn't matter. There's, there's maybe one case where, where it matters, but um, you will see that if you ever uh, uh, use it. But in fact, it's mostly you don't have to care. Okay, so this was the uh, repetition, uh, starting with something you already know. Now I'm going to come to things that you don't know yet. So, um, three profiles I promised you, so let's, let's define three profiles now. Now, how am I going to do that? Basically, profiles are sub-languages. That means they are subsets of OWL which uh, give you only certain expressive features and not others. Um, how do we define that most easily? Well, I want to define it by using formal grammars. Now, that uh, sounds more advanced than it actually is because a formal grammar for what I have shown you so far uh, could simply be written like that. So what this means here is an axiom of that language has one of the following three forms. It's a subclass axiom, it's, a, it's an instance, or it's a, a class instance or property uh, instance, so class assertion property assertion. And now this class C here can have many forms again. It can either be a class name, means it's just a, a label for a class, it can be top or bottom, it can be the intersection of two classes, the union of two classes, the negation of a class, or it can be a property restriction of the form exist property class or for all property class. And property again can either be just a property name or the inverse of a property name. So that's how we can basically break down the whole language on the, the two or three lines, right? So that's uh, an easy way to, to put on one side the definition of a language. And this is why I will use it to define the profiles. Because, in fact, um, the profiles I'm going to talk about now will all be restrictions of that. So we will just get them by leaving away some of the cases. Okay. This language, by the way, is called ALCI in research. So description logicians who um, write scientific papers would call that ALCI because I is for inverse properties and ALC is just the base language that we have with our things. Okay. Now, I'm first going to introduce the um, three profiles of OWL 
in a simplified version. So I want to focus on only the features which I think are really relevant and make a difference between the profiles and not on all features. You, if you have seen the OWL specification or also Palace talk yesterday, you know that there are a lot of features and it's uh, a long, long list if you want to name all of them. But in fact, the, the difference of the three languages what will also affect your choice uh, for one or the other is only in a very small subset of features. The first language I want to uh, introduce to you is uh, AL-EL. So the three languages are called AL-EL, AL-RL, and AL-QL, and uh, this is al -EL. EL is called EL because of historic reasons. It is based on a description logic which has been called EL, and this has just carried over. And we will see some typical applications later on. Usually people use it in ontology engineering. And let's have a look at the features that it, that it offers. So it has the same types of axioms. It can have subclass relationships, class assertions, property assertions. But the features it has for building class expressions are actually very restricted. So it can still have class names, obviously. It can have top, have top and bottom. It can have intersection of classes, and it can have existential role uh, property restrictions. So, what are we missing here? Well, there's no more disjunction, no more union here. There's no more negation, no more complement, uh, and there's no more universal restriction, and there are also no inverses. So it's a very, very simple language. However, you can still say a lot of things, because uh, you can um, use these kind of existential restrictions in particular to define uh, classes based on their properties. You can, for example, what people in medicine do, so they say that uh, fracture of the leg, so if you break your leg, right, uh, as a medical condition, is a fracture that occurs in the leg. So you can say it has an occurrence relationship to something in the class leg. It's someone's leg is broken. So we don't know which leg, but we can say, uh, so a fracture in the leg is a fracture that happens in some leg. And this type of definitions can very well be given with existential quantifiers. And uh, this is what people do a lot in ontology. Okay, so this is the L. RL. RL is, um, was called our RL because it resembles the rule language. I will explain why. RL is a bit more complicated to define because the idea here is that we can really read axioms, subclass inclusion axioms like rules. This is appealing to many people. Many people in computer science they understand rules immediately, but they don't, or they think they understand rules immediately, but they don't understand how. So if you can tell them basically the axiom is like if, then, uh, they are happy and are more comfortable modeling in that language. And uh, this is to some extent what RL uh, can achieve or tries to achieve, being like a rule language. Now, if you have a rule language, you have a distinction between rule bodies and rule heads, so premises and conclusions. And they are different, right? Normally, you can say certain things in the rule body as a premise, and other things in the conclusion. And in order to capture this, we have here to distinguish between the classes on the left, which are like the premises, and the classes on the right, which are the conclusions. Um, the classes on the left, again, allow me to use class names here, bottom, conjunction, disjunction, and existential. So that's not so different from EL, right? It just has uh, disjunction as well. Yeah? Union. And the classes on the right, that are the um, heads of the rules, if you want, they also allow me the class names and the bottom. But uh, <laughs> then they have intersection only, negation, and universals. So you see that there's quite a difference here. It's not symmetric. So you can use disjunctions on the left, but not on the right. You can use universals on the left, uh, on the right, but not on the left. And this has a reason, because um, you can easily read these, uh, these uh, uh, axioms that you get there as rules. Let me make a simple example. Um, 
it's an abstract example because otherwise the ball is not big enough. So, for example, if I have, uh, well, not this. Let me start again. So, what does that say? It says, uh, all the things which are in the class A and which have some P in B must also be in C. You could say all the fractures that are located in some leg are fractures of the leg, for example. Now, I can, why is that like a rule? Because I can think of it as a rule saying if, a, if some X is in A and has a there's a P property to some Y, which is in B, then X must also be in C. So I can just unfold it and put some variables in and it looks like a rule. And I will do another example here uh, for the universals to clarify that as well. So let's say, What do I do with that? So, the things in A have only P's that are also B's. So, well, I'm kind of come up with a good example now, but I think the abstract perspective is actually more useful here. So, of course, I can again say, okay, if, some, if the X is in A, that's clearly here, but what do I do with this? Well, what I do is I take this part as a precondition and I say basically what this says is, is if any A has a P property then, this, then the thing that this P property relates to must be a B. So actually the P is part of the precondition. So we have if X is an A and X has a P property to some Y then Y must be a B. Is that obvious? Too easy? Yeah, it's too easy. Okay, people, people not going to ask too easy, so that's good. Okay, so that's too easy. Now, um, then let me move on a bit. The idea is uh, this is um, possible here for all the x So you can mess this a bit, it can become more complicated than these examples, but basically all of the cases that you can express here can be written like these rules, like in prologue or data. And if you think if you take some feature which is not allowed here, for example, you take a universal restriction in the body position, you will find that this is not so easy to express in a rule. In fact, it just doesn't work out at all. So you would have to have some quantifier nesting there which just doesn't, doesn't match the idea we have when we say rule. So um, this is a reasonable restriction for um, a rule language. Okay, and finally, uh, the third profile I want to talk about is uh, LQL, the so-called query language. And this is a bit of a strange uh, piece because it's even more restricted than the, the, the previous uh, two. In fact, it has again the distinction between body and head concepts, but now in the body we are allowed to use almost nothing at all. So we can only, only use classes, top and bottom. And we can use existential property restrictions, but where we don't say what the filler is. So we can say, um, we can talk about the things that have some child, but we cannot talk about the things that have some child who is a professor. Or we can talk about the things that have some location, we cannot talk about the things that have some location in the lab. And so this is a very severe restriction in a way. On the other hand, in the but head side and the conclusion side, we are again allowed to say a few more things. Conjunction, negation, existential. Again, existential here, interestingly. Now with arbitrary fillers, but they have to come from the R side. Um, so again, there's a bit of a difference here. Here we have only universals, here we have existentials. And we have inverse rules. Now why is it called query language? Because uh, people often use these uh, to query databases, as we will see later on. So they have a very shallow, a simple ontology layer on top of the database to improve their data access. Okay, so here's the summary. Um, 
of our three tiny profiles and their main differences. So um, here I distinguish between the class on the body, on the uh, left hand side, uh, and the class in the uh, head, right hand side. For the LCs, all the same, but I can still make the distinction. And here you can see which features are actually allowed. And you see that what the crucial differences are. I will talk a bit more about it. Okay. Now, I will come uh, to each of the profiles, discuss what the profile is used for, what kind of tools you have available, uh, why you would use it and not the other one. Um, what do we see here? Any idea? Somebody has to be here. Anybody? Was anybody in the other track any time? Uh, yeah, that's linked data. So that's the linked data cloud, the famous, infamous linked data cloud. See, uh, see, oh, this is semantic web from a height. Um, okay, so this is a lot of data, and it's getting bigger and bigger. Not as quick as people would want it to grow, I think, in recent years, but a um, lot of data. And that, why am I showing you this? Uh, I want to start with LIL. And LIL, in fact, is the favorite language of people in linked data. So if you have, well, their favorite language is probably RDF, but if they have to use R, then LIL is their choice. And I will try to explain why that is the case and, and uh, how this is used there. Um, so then, inference task, you remember I showed you the inference tasks that you can look at in our reasoning. The so main inference tasks, tasks that people are interested in for LRL is instance retrieval. So they think about these large collections of data, which mainly in, in description logic terms consists of a huge A box. So there's a lot of data and a little ontology on top. And so you want to work with that data. And your main questions that you're asking are, what are the instances, what are the individuals in class C? What are the pairs of individuals which are related by proper TP? So you want to, want to access the instances. And now in such a case where you have this amount of data, you can't do that with a Tableau system. Because a Tableau system, what it does basically, it takes a hypothesis like maybe A is in C, and then it says, okay, let's check that. So it takes this hypothesis, it negates it first to see if there's a contradiction. If you try to assume that it's not the case, then it builds a tableau proof, checks if there's a contradiction, and if there is a contradiction, it will return yes, this is entailed, and if there's not, no contradiction in the tableau, it will say, okay, no, sorry, it wasn't entailed. Now, if you do that for a few billion possible facts and combinations of things, you will not be finishing very soon. So this is not a very viable approach if you have large-scale data. You want to work set at a time. You want to manipulate a large amount of a set of data, like in a database, at once, and get all the answers out of it. And this is why people in this area prefer to use a different approach to reasoning based on inference rules. You have seen some of this already in, in some of the other talks, or at least hinted at. Um, and it's easy to understand if you look at this translation into rules. Basically, all of the axioms we have in the ontology are similar to such rules. And so basically what we can do is we can just apply these rules, right? If we are given an A box, we can just check if this is satisfied, if there is any, we check where, what the axes are that have this property, and then we materialize, we infer something and store it in our database. So we can very easily see, in a way, how bottom-up inferencing could work. Um, now, this approach, uh, applying inference rules in order to find conclusions, is known under many different names. You may have heard some. So, in, in theory, proving people like to call it saturation or deductive closure, even, in logic. In databases, people speak of materialization. So, if you have, for example, views uh, uh, in a database, then they are materialized, which means you pre-compute the query result and store it in a table. Um, in logic programming and in production rule systems, people speak of bottom-up reasoning often, or production rules rather prefer to use the term forward chaining, I think. In description logic, people also have to use the term consequence-based reasoning for, for some reason. So um, basically, all of these are the same. The idea in all cases is 
you start with your input, you start with your ontology, and you apply inference rules as long as possible until you have computed everything that's computable, and then you stop. And why is that good in general? Well, the reason why it's good is that you start with your input, you start with what you have, and you only do the things which directly lead to new conclusions. If you have a tableau, for example, you have to check hypotheses. So you, in a tableau proof, you ask a question, and then the tableau prover will go and try to find out whether this question has the answer yes or no. And you don't really know which question to ask, so everything could be in every possible clause. And so you, you may have a huge amount of, of checks to do in order to find out what actually is the case. If you start bottom up with your data, you don't actually ask any questions. You just start with what you have, and if you can't do anything with what you have, you stop. You're done. If, and any effort that you actually invest in this computation directly leads to things which you are interested in. So, more or less directly. So, yeah, it's a big advantage of this approach is really that of all the conceivable consequences, of all the things that could hold, often just a very small percentage actually hold. Most classes are not superclasses of one another. Most instances are not in a certain class. And if you start your computation bottom up, you take advantage of this because you will only do the work for the things that actually hold. Uh, or at least you have a more targeted approach to looking for the things that hold, uh, as opposed to blindly trying everything. Of course, this is a bit oversimplified, and also in Tableau Provers, you have strategies to find out which questions are, are good to ask and which are not. But, uh, it's certainly more difficult. Okay, let's look at how this is actually done. So I want to show you an algorithm now, but it's in fact very simple, as you will see. So uh, a few rules here because I have a few features, but um, indeed we will see that this is very easy to read. So how does that work? So I have here inference rules. The inference rules I write according to, to the tradition of um, logic-based uh, deduction systems, I would say, in this style, where I say the premise of the inference is on top, the conclusion is on bottom, and sometimes I write a side condition next to it, which tells me that a certain extra condition is needed to apply the rule at all. All of the rules are very intuitive to read. So um, basically, first of all, the statements that we are interested in here are always ABOX statements. So they always talk about some instance of some class, or in some cases, some pair of instances of a property. And we can simply read that like this, for example, if we know that C is a D, and we have an X here which tells us that D is a subclass of E, then we can conclude that C is also an E. Obvious, very clear, not surprising. Um, Similarly here, if we know that C is an instance of the intersection of D1 and D2, then C must be in D1, and C also must be in D2. Okay. But I also have the inverse of this role. So this is how I can split an intersection into two individual statements. Here I have the other direction. If I know that C is in D1 and I know C is in D2, then I can concludes that C is in the intersection of D1 and D2. Again, should be plausible and intuitive why that holds. But interestingly, here we have a side condition. We say, we, of course this would always hold, right? This is always true. Um, if this is the case, then this is the case. But we only want to draw this inference in certain cases. Namely, we only want to draw it if D1 intersecting with D2 actually occurs in our ontology. So the idea here is that I don't want to draw any inferences which are not possibly relevant for deriving further conclusions. So I don't want to build all possible conjunctions of axes. Um, I just want to build the ones which are interesting for the axes in the ontology. And so I check at least if this occurs. I could make this check a bit more specifically. But this is enough. If I wouldn't make this check, what would happen? It would already this one rule would produce infinitely many entailments, right? Because I can, if you think about something like A of C, 
let's assume I just have this one information, then of course a particular way of applying this rule would be I take this information twice and I say this is the case. This is of course a very stupid deduction. We immediately see that we don't want that in most cases, but it could be done and I could continue like this. I can always build bigger and bigger intersections that I never need and this will already be defeated. Uh, semantically, this is the same as this. A intersected with A is just A. But syntactically, it's different. And in fact, it might be necessary to do that. So if in this particular approach, if we have a rule which says uh, A intersected with A implies B, we may need to construct this just to apply this rule. So it's, uh, this is really a purely syntactic approach. So it's just stupidly applying rules to build expressions. We don't think about here what the expressions really mean. And so even such things might be relevant. But we want to limit it a bit, that's why we have some side okay. The other rules are, um, again, not, not so difficult from, uh, to understand why they, are, why they make sense. So for example, if I know that all the P's of C are E, all the P's of C's are E's, uh, then, and I know that one particular P of C is the D, then I know that D must be an E. All my children are professors and I have a particular child, and this child must be a professor. Um, see, here in this case, the inverse is for the existential case. So here I have, if, uh, if I have a child and the child is a professor, then I can infer that I'm in the class of those things that have a child that is a professor. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, here we have an interesting case which is the uh, contradiction. So how do we deal with negation? In fact, there's only one way, place where negation is relevant in this calculus, and this is this. If we ever derive that C is in a class D and also in the negation of that class, then we derive bottom of C. We say C is in bottom, which is an obvious contradiction. And on the other hand, if we have uh, that C is either in D1 or in D2, then we can derive that C is in D1 union D2. Similar to the other cases. Okay, and finally we have two rules which are just changing the directions for the inverses. Okay, so this is a simple calculus. Now, um, the thing is, almost anyone could implement this, right? So with a bit of skill in, in Java or in some programming language and a bit of time maybe to think about how to do data structures, Basically, this is something you don't have to be a logician to, to apply. Because this is just check if this is there and if yes, then this. Of course, to make it fast, again, optimizations come in handy. But it turns out many people have implemented this and not all of them have even bothered with optimizations. So one particular reason why the RLL language is so popular is that this is such a simple idea that basically you can do that in RDF as well, so I could just translate all of these things to RDF patterns and the conclusions to RDF patterns, and I would get a, an inference calculus which would directly work with RDF representations as you find them on the link data web. And so it's indeed very simple to, to apply this calculus. There's no, no particular smartness needed to, to make it at least work. I mean, it will not be fast, maybe, if you don't optimize it further, but it will not completely explode if you just do it in a straightforward way. Which is really different from Tumblr, where you have to be uh, aware of many, many things before, in order to get it run. Okay, so that's one reason why RL is so popular. And has been implemented in many places. Now, I didn't really tell you how we use that calculus. I mean, in a way, it's kind of obvious, right? You derive things, and the things you derive are the conclusions that you have. But um, we have to, in fact, be a bit more specific here. We have to say, OK, uh, first you apply all these rules until nothing else happens, until you only get things you already have. And then you say, OK, how do I know if something was inferred? If an instance retrieval, I, I'm doing instance retrieval, right? So I want to know if a certain class assertion or property assertion is inferred. And 
there are two, two ways in which this can happen. First way is the obvious one. It can happen that the axiom was just derived by the rules. That's the one you would expect. The second one is the fact that bottom of C for some constant C was derived. So if we have derived that some individual is in the empty class, this is a contradiction, and this means that the ontology was inconsistent. And if it's inconsistent, then everything holds. And so um, we have to check that as well. Because these are the two cases. We can make a little example for this. Well, this is the part of rules that we need, and I think it will, will uh, explain a bit how this calculus works and allow me to flesh out a few other features that it has. So we have these, uh, these axioms here. Cats are a subclass of this class, which means if, if something is a cat, then, it's, then it is in this class, and this class is the things for which everything they prey on is a small animal. In other words, cats only prey on small animals. Well, house cats, I would say. Um, second axiom says, if something is an animal and it preys on some other animal, then it's a predator. Cats are animals, Sylvester's a cat, Sylvester preys on Tweety. Now, from this, I should be able to derive a few things. First of all, I should be able to derive that Tweety is a small animal because it's Sylvester's a cat preying on it. And I should also be able to derive that Sylvester is a predator because Sylvester preys on a small animal. Okay, let's see how that works. Well, first of all, we know that Sylvester is a cat, so we know that Sylvester must also be in this class. This is just an application of this first thing. So, we have Sylvester as a cat, and cats are things that prey on small animals. So Sylvester preys on small animals only. Well, I haven't chosen this one. Uh, this, this is this one that I just explained. The other one is here. Uh, of course, if it's a cat, it's an animal, so Sylvester's an animal. Okay, first, first two things. So first, two, first thing I have done is I have applied axioms from the ontology. Now the second thing I will do is I will hack this big axiom into smaller pieces, which I can then use to derive new things. So I know that everything that Sylvester preys on is a small animal, and I know that Sylvester preys on Tweety, so I can apply this rule, which, tells, which will tell me that Tweety is a small animal. Now I know Tweety is in the intersection of animal and small, so I can apply this rule and find out that Tweety is both an animal and small. Right. Now I have, with this I know, Sylvester preys on Tweety and Tweety is an animal, so I can apply, where is it? This rule. Say so Sylvester preys on Tweety, Tweety is an animal, so I can derive that Sylvester is in the class of things that prey on an animal. And now with this I have an important part of this premise here. I already know Sylvester is an animal. I now know he preys on an animal. So I can conclude that he is in the intersection of the two classes. This is this uh, thing here. So I know Sylvester is an animal that preys on an animal. And now I can finally apply this uh, axiom here, which tells me Sylvester must also be a predator. Okay. So the important thing here is. This, how this works is, first we apply some parts of the ontology to get complicated conclusions. Then we hack the conclusions into small pieces, and then we put the small pieces back together until we get the premise of another axiom of the ontology, which we can apply to get another conclusion, and we could hack it down again and build it up again. So it's always decomposing, composing. And the nice thing about this is, because we have these rules that allow us to decompose arbitrary expressions and compose them again, we do not need to transform our input. We don't need to have any kind of normal form or simplification. We can just take the ontology as it is and directly run these rules on it. Again, this makes it easier to implement. Um, how much am I going to talk about correctness? Um, at least, but 
Maybe first, are there any questions up to that point? No, it's all here, it's too here. Yeah. Um, okay, correctness. How do we know that this is true? I mean, you have been, people have been telling you a lot of things here, and you trust us, don't you? But you should. Uh, many wrong things are published. Uh, many errors happen. So how can we actually know that these calculi work? So I, I'm saying it works. Okay, great. Uh, uh, so so is, that, is that enough? No, I mean, ideally you should be able to, to understand at least have an idea how, how we come up with these kind of reasons. Uh, what I said already is that Correctness for us means the calculus should be sound and complete, and it should terminate, stop after some time. Um, I will quickly explain how that works without going into it. I don't want to prove anything here, but just to give you an idea how we actually know. I mean, how does that work? How do you get to these kind of rules? Um, in fact, soundness means the calculus only derives true things. How can we prove this? Well, it's not difficult. Uh, we just have to show that every single rule has this property. So if every single rule only derives true things from true things, then we know that by any combination of rules we will only arrive at other true things. And it's actually fairly easy to see. So if you look at this, these rules, you can easily check for every rule that if this is true and this is true, then this one will be. So that's how softness is true. Um, termination. Termination here is proven by showing that even if all possible inferences, all possible combinations of statements are derived, this is limited. It's not going to go on forever. We cannot, there are not that many conclusions even. So it's not, we don't even have to think about how the rules are applied. We can just take a look and see, okay, uh, the possible conclusions that this can derive at all are limited in number. There cannot be that many of them, so it has to stop. Why do we know that? Well, basically the main observation here is that because of the side conditions I had, remember this example here, um, because of these side conditions which ask that whenever I derive a new expression it has to occur in the ontology, and the only other thing I can do is hack a big expression into smaller ones. So if it already occurs in the ontology, it still occurs in the ontology. And with these side conditions, I, I can make sure that all the things I derive are axioms that use only class expressions and property expressions from the ontology. So, if you have 10 different class names, and you just look at the binary intersections of them, you would have already 100 possible binary intersections. So it looks like it could be a large number. But in fact, the rules that we have here, they only ever, okay, that takes too long. They only ever derive things that occur in the ontology. So, in fact, they um, are bounded in a much stronger way than it would be if you would just apply the rule in, in every possible way, even to a certain depth. In fact, you can only derive things about expressions in the ontology. And since the ontology is limited, and many things just don't occur in the ontology, you can be uh, sure that you don't need to derive them. So from this, we can derive that only a finite number of axioms is possible. And in fact, this is somehow cubic bound. In practice, it's usually not cubic. Luckily, it would be very bad if it was. Uh, OK. Completeness, um, that's the most difficult part. And I'm just going to, to sketch that. Um, how can we be sure that we don't miss conclusions? And this is now very, this is difficult, right? I mean, if, you, if I give you an algorithm and you want to, I ask you to check that it doesn't do something wrong, that's not so difficult. You just have to check what it does and verify that everything it does is basically correct and it doesn't lead to wrong results. But now if I give you an algorithm and ask you to check if it does everything it should do it and doesn't miss any cases, then you have to reason about what it what it possibly could forget. Is there anything we are missing here? And this is this is difficult to prove because um, 
if you come up with these rules, like many people can kind of come up with some rules. So you just look at these semantics and you say, this rule makes sense, this rule makes sense, and you just add them. But how do you ever know that you have enough rules? And basically, without looking much at this slide, this proof that this is the case is works along the lines of this relationship between axioms and rules. Um, who here knows about logic programming? Okay, so um, in logic programming you have the concept of the least model of a logic program. So often you say a lot the meaning of a logic program, so the magic of a logic program is uh, the minimal things that must hold in order to for all the rules to be true. Um, so you have a very similar situation to our calculus because you also apply the rules until nothing else happens. Of course, sometimes in logic programming it will always continue forever because you have function symbols so you can get a lot more, a lot more of derivations. But um, basically, the idea is that instead of having to look at all models, you look at just one minimum model, one least model. And yesterday already in uh, Mitri's lecture, there were a lot of models being drawn there, right? So you had examples of ontologies and then there was a model, how it would look. But technically this is not a reliable way to find a proof in description logics, because description logics are not about one model, they are about every model. If you say an ontology has a certain consequence, it means that every possible model of this ontology has this consequence. But there are many such models, there are infinitely many. And you can never check all of them. So that's uh, difficult. But uh, it turns out in this case, because we have this correspondence with the rule language, we can focus on one model, the simplest possible model, which only has those things being true that really have to be true. So that basically this minimal model only has exactly those things being true that we will derive in our calculus. And this is how this type of thing is shown. So, um, basically, we find that universal model, as it's called, the minimal model, and we show that the calculus we have derives exactly the things which hold in that minimal model. And this gives us this one to one correspondence between the world of models and the world of uh, calculus. Okay. Um, now, this is all very technical. Let's come to uh, applications, right? So, uh, I will not go through that. Can, if you are interested, you can look at it in the uh, lecture notes of the uh, But I, I gather most of you will not want to prove such a thing yourself. So I'm not going to elaborate on it. Okay, so where is LRL used? LRL is used in one general area which is called ontology based data access. So the idea there is. I have a large database, and this database uh, is considered for the purposes of the ontology uh, as an A box. So it gives me a lot of facts. And I now want to ask queries against the database. And I want to get results that, um, that are not just based on what's really stored in the database, but that are augmented with more information from the ontology. For example, if I know that the uh, knee is a part of the leg, and I ask for everything that is uh, well, part of a leg, then I should also find all the knees in my database. Now, unfortunately, this is not a good example because there are not so many databases with knees in them. Uh, well, maybe there are in a medical scenario, but let's, let's take another one. Um, say, species. We had some yesterday, so if I know that, that bald eagles are eagles, and I have a database which says Harry is a bald eagle, and somebody asks for eagles, then you want the query to also return Harry as an answer, because Harry is an eagle uh, by virtue of being a bald eagle. Now, um, this is called ontology-based data access, and the idea in general is that you can do that in all legacy applications that already use databases. Because the interface to the top, to your application, is still a query language. So if you currently use a database, 
you can augment this database with an ontology, get more results on top of it, and um, still you don't require to change all of your applications because the main, the main way you access your data is still based on uh, queries to a database. Okay, so that is what uh, many people want to do also in uh, enterprise application scenarios. So they have these uh, data collections and they want to query them. The main task here is instance retrieval and query uh, processing. Another thing that people do with uh, LOL is data integration. So, um, in particular on the web of data, but also in other scenarios. LOL allows you to use equality. I haven't used that here in my simple uh, case, but you can basically say that individual A and individual B are the same. And this is something that people use a lot to do data integration on the semantic web, but also to do data integration in other contexts like databases. You can uh, basically say that uh, two individuals from two different databases are in fact the same and you can use LLL as a data integration layer. It is very simple, I mean, compared to other enterprise data integration scenarios, it's not um, that expressive, I would say, but it is a lightweight way of handling it and in contexts where you already have RDF data, it's uh, often the preferred method. And, well, I already mentioned semantic search. I think this is one of the main applications of LLL. So what people have is they have a database uh, with a lot of information, maybe coming from different systems. They model an ontology on top of it in order to do data integration. And then they provide a search engine, for example, a document search engine, that uh, uses this ontology to find more um, results than you would otherwise get from, from the data sources alone. So that is, a, that is a typical way. And what this entails basically is that you need to use a database system for reasoning. So up to now we have talked about reasoners always as things you plug into Protege, right? So um, a reasoner is something you download and you have a Protege plugin and it works. But of course, this is not how it works in this area. If you want to do an enterprise search, you are not going to use Protege as a backend or a reasoner which runs on a single machine. You need a much larger scale approach. And so even, I, I mentioned initially that logically all the reasoning tasks are the same. But in practice, if you want to use that stuff, you need to think about what, you're, what scale you're working on, right? So it's not, if you want to manage a database sized collection of information, you can't use pellet, or you can't, I mean, you can't, you can't use any system that runs in memory on a single data, on a single machine, on a laptop. This is just not your scenario. You need a completely different class of systems. And it doesn't help you that mathematically speaking, this is somehow equivalent, because it's just an engineering question how these systems operate. Um, I want to focus, before I show you some tools, which I come to in a minute, I want to focus on one particular application of LRL uh, on the web. So I said maybe some people have been to the linked data track as well, so many people think of linked data, web data as being uh, an important thing these days. And indeed, LRL is the most, the favorite language there because it is very robust, right? You have these rules and you can apply them to anything. Even if the data is a bit noisy or there are mid errors in the data or some parts are missing, you can still apply these rules and you will get something out of it. Maybe not all. And now, the question on the web, of course, is how much of this do you actually need? I mean, our L is a complex language, it has many features, but in practice often you focus on a few core features. And um, we have done a kind of uh, study on that by taking the linked, linked data, which was called for uh, the Billion Triple Challenge, in fact. And this linked data set had a lot of RDF in it. And we tried to find out how much OWL is actually used in this data set. In this data set. And in order to find out how important this OWL is, we didn't just count 
because that doesn't help you much. Of course, you have a lot more data than ontology. Um, but the question is, how likely is it that you need to call for a certain feature if you want to reason with a certain data set of the algorithm? So even if you have a million facts and only one subclass axiom, it might be that all of these million facts require the subclass axiom or relate to the subclass axiom somehow. Uh, and you would rather want to support that in order to, um, in order to get all the results. And so we did a kind of page rank analysis. I'm not sure if some people may have heard of page rank, so it's the idea of uh, estimating how likely it is that you come across a certain page on the web or feature in our case. So, to simplify things, more is more. So, the higher the bars here, the more likely it is that a feature is relevant in an application. And this is a logarithmic scale, so every line here is one order of magnitude. So, if you go three lines down, it's already only one hundredth of a probability that you will ever use this feature in the web. And here are seven lines, so that's like ten millionths of a probability. Uh, that you will hit this feature. And if you look now at the distribution we got, you see that the main features people use are RDF property, RDFS range, domain, subclass of, subproperty of. So the very basic features, which are all found in RDF schema already, RDF schema here is all the features in red. Um, now the most prominent out features I'll jump simple vocabulary declarations, our class, our object property, which are not really expressive features yet. Um, data type property, annotation properties, so they are all just vocabulary declarations. Now, the main feature of our here is functional property, equivalent property, inverse of, disjoint with, same as, this is the equality I mentioned, so this is what people use to express equality between two things. And then there comes union, actually. Symmetric, transitive. Here is some other is wrong. So here is our existential on the web. Already like one order of magnitude behind the um, top ranked uh, RDF term here. And then things go down very quickly. So in particular, um, Okay, there are some sort of syntactic features here, but for, for example, complement of the negation is not very frequent. People don't use it a lot on the web. It's, it's actually rather rare if you look at it. Also, um, what else do we have here? Intersection of is here. So that's the, that's the conjunction of two classes, the intersection is is actually a very rarely used feature compared to other features on the web. Um, why am I showing you this? this? I'm not showing you this to say this is not an important feature. It's just meaning that's not used very much in this particular application. And also I'm showing you this to explain why um, if you look at tools, many tools support certain features and don't support others. Um, because users just didn't ask for it. And so again, this is a question for you as a user. I mean, most of you will not develop ontology reasoners. But if you need a feature and you can't find a tool that has it, don't say, oh, pity, I can't use the feature. But rather, go to the developers, tell them, I need this feature. Because it's usually this chicken and egg problem. Uh, people don't use the features because tools don't support them. Tools don't support them because people don't ask for it. So if you need a feature, um, kick the developers, kick the companies, the academics who do that stuff to make it happen. Because technically, from a logical viewpoint, the things back here are often simpler than the things up here. But still, people prefer to support what's here, obviously, because it's more important for their applications. OK, now let's look at what applications do. Uh, last thing on our L, and then we can go into the break. Marcus, um, can I ask you one thing before you Of course. Ask? So when you when you talk about our thing as uh, being used by Halloween, do you do you mean it's used uh, according to what it actually means, or is just used to indicate some sort of connection between two things? This is a syntactic analysis. Um, the data set we used here has more than a billion triples. 
we have no idea if C units of R same as are all good or not. So you're basically asking if they express the right thing. I remember there was a lot of discussion on the how same as was just used as some sort of indication of you know, the relevance of similarity between two things, not, not how it's actually defined. Because it's um, a strong, you know. Yeah, I mean, there are two, there are two ways I would even say in which R same as is abused. So um, you're right, in one way, often people say something is the same as another thing when it is just really related or they think it's the same but they didn't really look into it. And this is dangerous because it can lead to many entailments <laughs> which were not intended. And the second thing, the way in which people have used our sameness is they use it on vocabulary, on, on schema elements like classes and properties. So they, they say this class is the same as the other class. In RDL you would really say equivalent class. You would say this class is equivalent to the other class if you mean that. But what they do is they say the class is the same as the other class. And yesterday we had some discussion on meta modeling. Um, it's allowed to do that in RDL, but it doesn't have any meaning in RDL reasons. So RDL reasons, if you say class one is the same as class two, that doesn't make them infer that the classes are equivalent. In fact, if it would make them infer that this is already one reason for undesirability of our food, that you connect equality with equivalence in that sense. Now, I'm not sure where, where equivalent classes is here. I think it's also high up. Equivalent property at least is here. Um, equivalent classes. Equivalent classes here. So it's also used heavily. But you can still, not as heavily as, as all same as, and you can still find many places where people use same as for classes. And I think this is in practice the only real relevant difference between our full semantics and our DL semantics or, or the F-based and direct. That same as works on classes in direct in, in the F-based semantics and doesn't work on classes in DL semantics. Um, okay, yeah. So uh, on the other hand, what Pavel said, I think it's just a general general thing you find in many places with web data. It's not just all same as everything on the web tends to be wrong, right? So, <laughs> so it's a general, I mean, if you find something on the web, uh, the default assumption should be it's wrong. And of course, in a system like ours, in, in a reasoning system that does not have a notion of maybe right or let's, let's see what happens, but just says, okay, I have all these axioms, they are all true in, in the same way of being true, and I just do what I can. It's difficult to, to handle this noisy data because um, either it's true or it's not true. There's nothing in between. You can't say uh, most say that should be true unless they have very strange defects on my, my ontology. And people have, have been doing research on how to clean web data, how to filter out errors, how to take away certain axioms which have um, problematic consequences. And so this is done. But yeah. There are still a lot of errors happening here. Okay. Support, tool support. Um, database support varies time. So I have here, what's this table? This table is a table of um, tools. Not all tools by far, but the tools which I think are most, most used in database applications of our IR plus support. And for all of the tools, I have here a list of features where they are most different on. With a check if it's supported and a minus if it's not supported. Uh, so the features here are subclass of, subproperty of, range and domain, same as, so that's a quality, transitive properties, symmetric properties, inverse properties, inverse functional properties. Uh, and now, if we look at the toolscape, we see that there are a number of database applications that have fairly complete support for our LD states. Notably, um, Oracle's 11G database, which is supposed to be industrial strength kind of uh, database application. Certainly, it's expensive, if that's any indication. Um, Aldin, also a commercial system, much smaller company. 
um, can do a lot of reasoning with rules. Uh, PellateB, I'm not sure where, what the status is. Bijan is not here. There was some. It's not being maintained. I was expect expecting that. So it's all it's all superseded by Starlog. It's ah uh, yeah, of course Starlog. Yeah, this is not up to date. It should Starlog should be listed here. Definitely. But, but it was released after you published the state. Yeah. Um, so then, yeah, Starlog would be target for CS solution here. Uh, Palette we had a nice feature. It could also go up to LTL in a certain way. So it was a bit of a different approach from the novel rule-based engines, but uh, it. Uh, didn't didn't uh, find so so much approval apparently, so it's not number of maintains. There's something called the original agenda, some people developed it, I'm not sure what the status is. So I think here among the LL databases, the two commercial solutions are LIB and LL and G are the most popular ones in a way, uh, if you need all of LL. And they both apply basically such a rule-based algorithm as I explained to you. There are some things you may have heard of Jedi and of Sesame. So for Jedi and Sesame, there are, which are triple stores, RDF stores, there are various extension modules which allow you to do certain amounts of our reasoning. Some of them almost cover all of our L with some rule-based approach. Others only cover RDFS, which is like subclasses, subproperties, range, and domains, but not, not same as, not transitivity. And I'm not sure about that scalability effect. If you have a really large application, I don't think Jenna or Sesame will, will really cut it, but for doing experiments, it might be a good start because both of them are free and not too hard to make, to, to, to work with. Virtuoso is also a, a commercial database that has an open source edition that you can get for free. It has quite a good support for features. Uh, it doesn't support range and domain for some reason, which I find surprising because it's very well widely used. And it would probably not be hard for them to add this support. Um, what's the support same as and transitivity, so you can do this equality reasoning and data integration with it. And as I said, it has a free um, open source edition that is also packaged with Debian and another Linux distribution, so it's, 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 there's some advantage on that side in terms of community support and, and um, cost, of course. Allegro Graph, another um, commercial database, the fourth major commercial database maybe here, has some other features it doesn't support. And well, there's one to I will come to that. That's another that's about QL, Jedi, and Sesame I mentioned. And then there's finally a system called Four Store, which is a triple store, it's also open source. Um, it doesn't support any kind of reasoning by default. There is a plugin for it which makes it support these four features. I'm not sure how, how practical this is in, in, in real applications, but at least there's something. So what you can see here mainly is that there is a bit of a line between systems that try to support the whole fragment and systems that just cherry pick features that they think are important for their customers. And um, finally, systems that only focus on RDFS, RDF schema. And basically, if you have an application, it's not just saying, I want our app. You have to say, I want this feature, I want that feature, and then make your shots. OK. I have one minute left, and I will not need them, so I can take questions. That's going to be the next topic after the break. You can think about what this actually is. <laughs> so thank you.